Good morning, everyone. Hey, uh, welcome to Waterfront, um, and a, a special warm welcome if you are new, if it's your first time, um, it's great to have you here. Um, my name is John, and I'll be leading the service today. Earlier this week, I was uh, reading Psalm 30 and um, it was an encouragement to me, so I thought I'd share it with you all now as we start our service. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you, while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, seeing all you who are upright in heart. And we're going to do that just now because we are so blessed that we have been completely forgiven and we are righteous in God's eyes. So let's sing because he is worthy of all our praise. Are you feeling in good voice this morning? Or you're just absolutely shattered because it's so warm this week? <laughs> you're all just glad to not be sweating for once. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I was going to say there's not many of us up here this morning. So one of my favorite quotes from... Um, a Wren Collective concert was, they said, you are the worship team, you are the band. And that's true, you are, aren't you? So, so stand up and get going. <laughs>
take your seats. <laughs> so reading out a few of the notices um, this week, uh, house groups are back on, so get in contact if you'd like to attend that. Uh, we have youth on Friday, um, and then some, some more specific ones. Um, Beth Gamson has um, now started as her, um, her role with the church, so um, praise God for that, and let's be keeping her in mind and praying for her. Um, Waterfront um, football's team has now officially started as well, um, and they'll be playing their first game on Tuesday um, at Elba Freedom Leisure Centre, so if you want to come and watch or support that, then come along. Um, and also um, with me, um, as some of you may know, I am doing Relay this year, and this is working with uh, UCCF to support and encourage students on their mission and campus, and that is to preach the gospel to the students at uni. So um, first of all, thank you so much um, for your support, both financially and in prayer. Um, I've been so blessed by that, so thank you. Um, and Relay has now started. Um, and so how did this begin? Well, we had a training week, um, our orientation week, and this was a, a wonderful week to get to know all the other Relay workers, um, to get to listen to some great talks um, on 2 Timothy about mission, um, how to approach it, approach it uh, um, its purpose, and the difficulties and challenges that come, but also, um, why we do it, um, and it's all about um, sharing the gospel so that others may be saved. Um, so yeah, that was a wonderful week. And then I moved on, well, we moved on straight to Forum. Forum is an event where thousands of students come along, um, and it's particularly aimed at um, students who are, have a role in leadership in the Christian Union. Um, so it was great to see a lot of the students from Swansea Christian Union come along. Um, and it was, it was a great week of encouragement of teaching how we can boldly um, proclaim the gospel on campus, um, courageously preaching it um, as we have no fear because God is on our side and we have no shame. And so yeah, that was a great week. So thank you for, um, thank you for your prayer and please pray for the students as they um, will be coming shortly in just a few weeks' time. Um, so be praying for that and their freshers' week that they may faithfully proclaim Jesus' name um, on campus. Also, uh, this Sunday is Anya and Caitlin's last um, Sunday with us this year. Um, are they here today? Um, if you'd like to come up to the front, um, I'd love to pray for you. Um, Anya is moving um, to uni, to Surrey, um, doing... Um, to become a vet, hopefully, so um, that's wonderful news. Um, and Caitlin is off to Australia, um, so I'll just pray for you now. Um, yeah, Lord, thank you um, for Anya and Caitlin. Um, thank you that, um, for the blessing that we have of having them in this church. And I pray that you will be with them in these years, um, I, in this year ahead. Um, and I thank you, I thank you that you will be, that you go out before them. And I pray that you'll bless them, that they will be fruitful in whatever they do, and they will be a light shining out to you, Lord. Um, yeah, you would just use them to um, proclaim your name um, and bless them in that, Lord. Thank you for them. Amen. Yeah, James and um, the band are going to now come and lead us in some more worship. I can't predict what's going to happen this morning. I've had a spontaneous clap at the end of an amen. Who started that? <laughs> oh. You'll be grateful to know that the last song, that's probably the most lively we're going to be, so you can kind of be quite still in your worship uh, in all this heat. Actually, Kev, can you open that door, please? Let's get a bit of a draft going, shall we? Really bossy this morning, aren't I? Hmm. Uh. 
Let's all watch Kevin for a moment doing something awkward. <laughs> he can't open the door now. <laughs> That's embarrassing, Kev. <laughs> Push harder. <laughs> it's a fire exit, so it's easily going to open. <laughs> It's not broken, he just not, isn't going to open it, apparently. Oh, okay. Sit down, God. <laughs> wow, now I'm making things awkward. Okay, let's stand and I'll say a quick prayer and we will worship God together. Thank you, Lord God, that you are bigger, more powerful and wiser than us. Thank you that our lives are safe in your hands. Um, and that whatever might happen in our lives around us and in this world where there seems to be so many things that go wrong all the time, that you bring peace and you make it well with our souls, Lord. We thank you that we have a sure hope in you, that you will take our lives from one degree of glory to another as we abide in you. Holy Spirit, thank you for your work in us. Jesus, thank you for your your sacrifice that has brought us this new resurrected life and we pray that we will live in it in you and seek you this morning thank you for all that you've done for us amen there is a hope that burns within my
Just before we sing our next song, we're going to hear something from God as Keith comes and shares what God has laid on his heart. Let's just take our seats for a moment. Haven't I said to you, seek first my kingdom and all gifts will be given to you. These gifts are special gifts. Gifts for the edification of the church. Gifts for the power to use in the world. Gifts to reach the people. I am the God of the natural, but I'm also the God of the supernatural. And these gifts are supernatural. Wait, ask, seek, and I will give. I am waiting for you to ask me. I'm waiting for you to seek me with all your heart, and I will bless you. I will bless you with these gifts. So that you can be of use. You can be my tools of choice in reaching the people, in reaching the lost, reaching the lonely, reaching the fearful. Because as you seek my kingdom, you will receive. Thus says the Lord. Oh man, as we sing this next song, let's seek. Thank God he's a giving God. He's more willing to give than we ever had to receive. And every one of us this morning, I'm sure, needs something more of God in our lives. The Bible says to earnestly or eagerly desire spiritual gifts. 
And let's pray that God will deposit something of those gifts that we read of in 1 Corinthians and in Romans, that God would deposit something by His Spirit in our hearts even this morning as we worship together. Let's stand and sing one more song before we have the reading of the word. Thank you. God's word together. Um, this morning we're reading from Mark chapter 4. If you want to turn to it, it's quite a chunk. We're doing 1 through to 20. Um, Mark chapter 4, 1 to 20. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into the boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside, beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around, those around him, 
Those around him with the twelve asked, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but to those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, the ones who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have, they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you knowing that you are our King, our God, our Savior. And Lord, we praise you and we worship you right now. And Father, we come to you confessing our sins, ones that we know that we've done and the ones that we know we haven't done, Lord. And we ask that you'd forgive us and let us be a, a pleasing aroma to you again, O oh Lord. Lord, cleanse us in the blood shed by Jesus on the cross. Yeah. Lord, as we've heard this, uh, the scripture reading, Lord, may we cultivate our hearts, Lord, as we receive your word, that we may not harden it like those did in the wilderness in Israel. But Lord, may we receive it and do as the word says. Uh, Father, as we, as we come to hear the word, Lord, would you bless Arnie? Would you help him? Would you send your spirit so that you would uh, convict us of the things we need to be convicted, to see what we need to see about you, O oh Lord? Um, yeah, Father, prepare our hearts now as we receive this word. And Lord, if there's anyone in the congregation there's at a, a time of where life is not good, Lord, would you bless them? Would you be with them? Would you surround them? Yeah. And Lord, for those that are at the top of life and enjoying all the gifts that you've given them, Lord, Lord, we praise you and we thank you. And Lord, we, 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 we want to rejoice in their rejoicing. But we also want to be um, mourning with those who mourn. And so Lord, come around us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Trust I can keep you awake this morning because it's so muggy, so hot, so sticky, and everybody's fanning themselves. But I pray that God somehow, despite the elements, would break through and just speak to us. We're going through the Gospel of Mark. We're in that uh, passage in chapter 4 that Billy read to us, the first uh, 20 verses, known as the parable of the sower. So far in Mark's gospel, we've seen Jesus move in the miraculous as the lame walk, the sick are made well, the blind see, the tax collector and the sinner are offered hope. And in these verses in chapter 4, we see Jesus teaching what is called a parable. And a parable simply is a story that makes a point. Note that Jesus begins his teaching in verse 3 with that word, listen. It's a very strong word. It's an imperative. It's a command. Our attention is mandatory. Listen, he says. And our response to his command makes 
a difference, an eternal difference. Jesus knew, you see, that not everyone gathered on the beach on that particular day would really hear his message. He knew that some had already made up their minds who he was or who he wasn't. They listened without listening, hearing without hearing. And we've all been there, have we? Especially as kids, you know, don't touch. We've heard it, but what do we do? We touch. We've heard without hearing. And the words went out, went in rather, one ear and out through the other, through the predetermined filter and landed on the rock hard surface of their hearts in this particular passage. For others, the hearing wasn't dull. Life appeared to take root, but what began didn't last. But yet for others, they heard and their lives bore much fruit. What made the difference? Well, to answer the question, we must look at this parable in two major parts. First, we must consider the sower who sows the seed. And secondly, we must understand the type of soil. So this morning, let's look at these two. First of all, the sower who sows the seed. A sower went out to sow, said Jesus. What does he sow? Well, Jesus tells us in the 14th verse of this particular chapter that he went out to sow the word of God. Listen to Jesus. The farmer sows the word. Now, who is the sower? Well, the sower this morning is anyone who sows the word of God. The sower this morning, if you're a Christian, the sower is you and me. The preacher on a Sunday morning, the missionary in the third world country, the employee at lunch with his co-workers, the university student at campus, the parent, the parent telling a Bible bedtime story to his child, Caitlin, way down below in Australia. The sower is anyone who shares the word of God, spreading the seed of the gospel as he goes or she goes about their daily lives. And the challenge for you and for me this morning is this, how active are we in sowing or spreading the seed? Do we keep it in our pouch or in our bag or do we sow it? Some of us can be guilty of just taking the seed for a walk. But what Jesus wants us to do is to throw it, to sow it. Let me say that at the most fundamental level, of course, Jesus is the sower. He spreads the seed of the word, calling all to repent and believe because the kingdom of God is at hand. So we know, yes, ultimately Jesus is the sower. He's the sower and he's the reaper. Nevertheless, in God's economy, he has chosen to work with you and me. In fact, in Mark's gospel towards the end, it says that the Lord worked with them confirming his word with signs that accompanied it. And of course, we have the Great Commission right in the final chapter of this particular gospel where Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we were encouraged in the uh, prophetic word this morning to throw out the seed in, that, in one sense when God says to share it with the lost, the lonely, the needy, and so on. How does the sower sow the seed? 
Well, we see in the opening verses that Jesus taught uh, this parable on the shore for all to hear. Sowing the seed of the Word of God on all kinds of soil. So for me, this says that the seed is spread indiscriminately. So how do we sow? Indiscriminately. We just throw it out there, far and wide, on all kinds of grounds. And of course, some fall on hard paths, some fall into good soil. But the field is covered. You see, in the ancient world, the farmer sowed and then he ploughed. Some seed went into unproductive places. And that's simply how it was. Some seed fell on the path. Some fell among the rocks and the thorns. The farmer couldn't make his field perfect before spreading. He just went out and spread the seed. And sometimes what appeared to be good soil turned out to be useless and vice versa. Nevertheless, he spread his seed throughout the field, doing what he could to prepare for an abundant harvest. Then he waited to see what seed would yield the crop. Our responsibility as Christians is to sow the seed of the Word of God everywhere and let God do the rest. The Apostle Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. You see, in a lot of businesses, they want their salesmen to target certain people for sales. I'm sure Jonathan Morgan, uh, as a salesman, uh, as a company director, is teaching his employees, as he probably was taught, you target a group. They don't want the salesman to waste his time going everywhere and cornering everyone. Part of the reason for this is they know that certain people will never buy the product. For example, if you're a car salesman, you don't go up to a child and try and sell a car because you know the child has no ability whatsoever to purchase it at all. And sometimes as Christians, we can be guilty of working, as far as the spreading of the gospel is concerned, with the salesman mentality when it comes to the seed of the gospel. We can be guilty of looking at certain people and think to ourselves automatically, this person will not accept the message of salvation offered in the gospel. We believe that the person is too bad or too hard a heart to want Jesus or that the person will not understand the gospel message. Listen, it's not our job to choose but to sow. And we sow everywhere. The farmer in the parable told by Jesus spread his seed everywhere. And from a human point of view, looking at all the facts and circumstances, when it comes to a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus in the Bible, he looked like hard ground. He looked as if he had a close heart as far as the gospel were concerned. In fact, his very actions bellowed out, this gospel is not for me. I want nothing to do with your Jesus. Nevertheless, the seed was thrown his way. And later on, 
This man whose heart seemed to be hard and close to the gospel writes to believers in Rome and said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for all who believe. And to the church at Philippi, he says, Oh, listen, guys, I want to know Christ and experience His mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him and share in His death. Think of John Newton, the one-time captain of a slave ship and an investor in the slave trade. He was a rough, tough, ruthless, hard man who made money on the misery of others. However, someone went out sowing and threw some seed his way and from a slave trader he became an abolitionist. He was converted, and uh, towards the end of his life, he said this, Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. And he goes on to write that famous hymn of his, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And then he penned the words, How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. No one can afford to be choosy about the spreading of the seed of the gospel. Every person in your street, in your family, in your workplace, in university or college needs a chance to hear the gospel message and to receive or reject Christ as Savior. We must be willing to share the message of salvation with everyone we can, spreading or sowing the seed and giving everyone a chance to hear. You see, God can make the message alive. Your testimony, which you may think is mundane, dull, and boring, God breathes life into it as you share it with your family and friends. And who knows? Their hearts may be that good heart that receives the message. One man said this sobering statement. If you choose not to sow the seed, you may have taken their one chance to hear about salvation in Jesus. Wow. If you choose not to sow the seed, you may take their one chance to hear about salvation in Jesus. But Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So therefore, this morning, we must consider the sower who sows the seed. That's you and that's me. And our responsibility is not to be choosy, but to throw the seed everywhere. And may God help us to be good sowers, not just carrying the seed around in our bag or carrying our Bibles under the arm just to look holy, but rather to throw the seed of the Word of God. And then note that Jesus highlights here different kinds of seed. Or different type of soil, rather. Jesus prevents, uh, presents rather four types of soil. But there are ultimately only two kinds of soil, really. The soil of unfaith and the soil of faith. Note that the first three types of soil, really, are bad soils. And it's only the last that is good. 
So here are the four types of uh, soil explained by Jesus. You find them in verses 15 through to 20. First, we have the hard and dry soil in verse 15. The shallow and rocky in verse 16 and 17. The crowded and anxious in verses 18 and 19. And then the soft and open in verse 20. Let's briefly look at each of this. First of all, we have the hard and dry heart. Listen to verse 15. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear... Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Who have we seen so far in the Gospel of Mark who possess this kind of heart? Well, of course, it's the Pharisees. They don't accept Jesus as their Lord. They oppose him as their enemy. The more Jesus speaks, the more he heals, the more he teaches, the harder their hearts get. This is the scariest heart of all. It's completely closed to Jesus. It's uninterested in hearing him and therefore unable to to hear him. What happens to this kind of heart? Well, when they hear, Jesus said, Satan immediately comes and takes the seed or the word away. It snatches, he snatches it before it sinks in. However, let's not fall into the trap of thinking that just because someone doesn't respond quickly to the gospel, that they have a hard and dry heart as far as the gospel is concerned. You see, many a die-hard atheist has, after long search, received with gladness the seed of the gospel and have become great ambassadors to Christ. Our job is not to judge, but to sow. And if you sense a hardness of heart right now, as you're listening, whether here or at home, please consider that perhaps the reason you're here or listening today is because Jesus Christ is slowly but surely grinding away at that stony heart of yours. Because as you listen, the Apostle Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so if you're listening this morning and you think you're, you're one of those with that hard, stony heart, listen, the very fact that you're listening probably is telling you that God is working in your heart and in your life. Then the second kind of Soil is the shallow and rocky heart. Look at verses 16 and 17. Others, like the seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. And we see this kind of heart in the crowds that follow Jesus. These are what I would call one day wonder Christians. And I'm sure we've all met those along the way. They like the latest fad, something very popular for a short, pe uh, short period of time. They're simply jumping on the Christian bandwagon. They love him for his miracles but leave him for his exclusive claims. They don't stick with him because their heart isn't just open enough for him. They say they believe, but they don't endure, proving that in the first place they didn't really believe. 
when following Jesus gets uncomfortable, inconvenient, discouraging, risky, they leave. They don't sign up for the hardship. And I know many Christians like this in my time as a pastor. Hands up in the air rejoicing and praising for a month or two, and then they've gone. And we've all probably known someone who's been just like that. With this heart, things are good for a while. But because we've never considered the Word of God, never chewed on it, we've never really thought it through. And when things are tough, we leave Him for something else. And this kind of heart is seen in the Bible times, in Jesus' time, with some of His own disciples. I'm not talking about His the Twelve now, but the other disciples who are around Jesus. And in John chapter 6, where He tells them, I'm the bread of life, He who eats of me, you know, will be satisfied. When He says all that stuff, that He's the bread of heaven, we read in verse 66 of John chapter 6, from this time, many of his disciples turned their backs and no longer followed him. When the going got tough, they were off. They had that shallow, rocky heart. Then there is the other type, the third kind, which is the crowded and anxious heart. Listen to verses 18 and 19. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things came in and choked the word, uh, making it unfruitful. This is the kind of people that have got so much going on in their lives that they can't afford to have Jesus in the center. Jesus is on the circumference. They've got their lifestyles, they've got their ambitions, they've got their desires, they're building up wealth for themselves, and if Jesus can fit into all of that, all well and good. But if he can't, tough. It's Jesus on their terms. Whereas Jesus wants to be center. You cannot serve, he said, God and money. Now he's not criticizing people who go out on a Monday morning to, to work in order to get money to live. Every one of us should be doing that because the Bible says if we don't work, we don't eat. But when the things of this world take the place of God in our lives, when we put, push God to the circumference because our career comes first, our wealth comes first, our desire, whether it is for, for, for entertainment, for sport, for whatever it is, if all those things come first before Jesus, then it's all going to choke us. And we're going to have that kind of crowded an anxious heart. But the Christian, you see, says, Jesus, be the center. Jesus first, Jesus second, Jesus only. It doesn't mean that we don't get involved in the other things. But we fit those other things around Jesus and not Jesus around the other things we try to fill our lives with. And then finally, there is the soft and open heart. Look at verse 20. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce crops. Some 30, some 60, some a hundred times what was sown. This is the heart of Jesus' disciples. They accepted his word. They followed, followed him in hard times. They stuck with him when they didn't understand. They drew near to him. They lean on him. They want Jesus. 
And to them is given the secrets of the kingdom of God. And in the prophetic word this morning, God said, seek first the kingdom of God. Then all these other stuff will be given to you. The soft, open heart is the heart of every true Christian. It's the heart that has accepted Christ, that has listened to his word. That is, good soil represents people who hear the message and seek to live by the message. They are people who have strong faith and remain dedicated to a Christian lifestyle even when things get difficult. These are Christians who produce fruit in their lives. Now note, not every one of us will produce a hundredfold. Some 40, some 60, some of us may just, just 10. But at least we're living for Jesus and our lives is producing something. And I don't know about you, but I want my life to produce something. I want to, after, you know, you know so many years, I don't know, 30 odd years in, in Christian ministry, I want to look back and say, I've got a bit of fruit to show for my ministry because I'm living for Jesus. And at the end of the day, you see, we can recite all the creeds, we can recite all the theologians. We may, you know, our theology may be 100%. But at the end of the day, by their fruits, you shall know them. If my life doesn't produce fruit, then I have to put a question mark behind my Christian living. Good soil makes Jesus priority. It means making time for him rather than trying to squeeze him into our busy schedules. It means pursuing a personal relationship with him as we pursue a relationship with a love interest. Getting to know him, speaking to him often, trusting him and making time for him. Seeking Jesus is an unquenchable longing. My soul, says the psalmist, thirsts for you, as I thirst for water in a dry and weary land. The closer you get, the more you want to get even closer. This relationship spills over into the person you are the way you treat others, and the way that you live your life. In closing, let me close with this. Maybe you walked into church this morning not wanting Christ. Maybe you tuned into your TV this morning not really wanting Jesus. But I trust you're going to walk out wanting him. I trust this morning that whether in a song that has been sung, the reading of scripture, the prayer that has been prayed, the prophetic word, the preaching of the word, I trust that a seed has been sown. Allow your heart this morning to become that soft an open heart. Let Jesus into your life. Trust him to lead you and to make your life fruitful. Go out, church. Sow the seed everywhere. And in so doing, believing that God will give the increase. Because let me tell you, there's some good soil out there. It's just as yet the seed hasn't, the seed hasn't been thrown their way. God help me 
God help us to just sow the seed. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to now sing um, our last song um, of worship when James gets to the front. Um, and uh, we're going to take up collection um, while doing this. So if you're, if you're new or visiting, feel free to, to let that pass by. Um, and then Nathan's going to finish our service in prayer. I'm here, John.
Lord, I thank you so much, Lord, um, for the word that has been preached. I pray that we may be able to remember it, Lord, and live out um, as so as, Lord, this week, Lord, for you. Please give us the words to say and the actions to perform to show the love of Christ to those around us so that, may, that they may know of your amazing love and that you died for them, Lord, that your atonement is so wonderful and they can have it too. So just please guide us and comfort us in this week. May we not be distracted by uh, the affairs of this world, but by the things of you, Lord, to show the kingdom, Lord, to these people, Lord. So please, Lord, may we seize every opportunity that is uh, of you, Lord, and take that door to show them, Lord, um, that you are a great God. Thank you, Lord. Please pray for, uh, may we have traveling mercies uh, for when we get back. Now you, beloved, um, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion who are doubting, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.